Well, I hope you got your uh, aloha drink this morning, your Hawaiian soda. Usually they're called Italian sodas, but we renamed them today, and uh, they're Hawaiian sodas. Man, uh, Hawaii is one of my favorite places. I've been there three times, trying to figure out how soon my fourth time uh, will be, but every time I've left, I said, God, I'd live here for you. I would. And uh, so, you know, we've got the church at Maltby, the church in Monroe, and I'm saying, Lord, if you want to start the church in Maui, here I am. (laughs) Send me. And if you feel God leading you, talk to me after service, and we can partner in that endeavor together. Well, my name's Tyler, and uh, I serve as the student ministries pastor here at the church, primarily get to work with uh, 6th through 12th grade students, and uh, it's my honor uh, to be able to do that and then bring uh, the Word of God to you today. We're continuing in our series that we started last week called Seven Letters, and we're looking in the book of Revelation and seven letters that were written to seven different churches uh, in Asia Minor at the time, and it's uh, John who was writing these and writing these for encouragement, but also correction which we, both, we need both in our life. We need encouragement from God, and there's also times that God needs to remind us and steer us back towards the right way and the right path. And today we're going to be looking in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 through 11, and we're going to be looking at a church in Smyrna, the church at Smyrna. And the title of this message this morning is called Real Riches. The church in Smyrna, Real Riches. Uh, And before we get started uh, in the text, I just want to explain a little bit about this church and the location and what they were facing. Have you ever wondered what you'd do, and maybe some of you dream about this too much, if you won the lottery? Like, what would I do? Uh, What would I buy? I know if my wife won, she would buy a home on the Kirkland waterfront. That would be like her dream. Mine would be like a hunting ranch in Montana or Wyoming. Uh, Those two dreams don't really go hand in hand, so we'll probably never win. Um, You know, we don't play the lottery, so we can't win. But maybe I have like a distant relative that like has an inheritance waiting for me. You know, anyone ever wondered that? Like you hear those stories, you're like, man, I wonder if I do. I'm like, probably not. Um, But this is a, a church that was living in a very prosperous it was a prosperous city in a very prosperous area, and, uh, and there was a lot of wealth that, flew, that, that flowed uh, through this city. It was 40 miles north of Ephesus at the mouth of the river Meles, and it was the second of the seven churches and the only other church that was written to that was on a seaport. And the church of Smyrna is a study on what it means to be rich. Now, we have a view of what rich means and looks like. And God has a view of what rich is, and they're not necessarily the same. And living in the Northwest, and especially this part of the state, we live in a very affluent area as well. I mean, have you seen the housing market lately? Maybe you've driven through a neighborhood and you're like, wow. Uh, me, when me and my wife first got married, we lived in Newcastle simply because it was halfway between Maltby and halfway between Federal Way where she was working. And uh, we rented a basement, like a mother-in-law unit, and uh, we would go for walks, and we'd walk among some of these homes in Newcastle. If you don't know what Newcastle is, it's like the east side of Bellevue up in the hills there. And we'd walk, and we'd see some of these houses, and we'd be like, oh, my word. Like, these are like modern castles. And we said, what do these people do for jobs? We said, we don't know. All we know is that they're not youth pastors and they're not teachers. That's all we know. Like, that's what we could land on. Um, But, you know, it was this, like, we live in a very affluent area, much like Smyrna would have been. And for me, moving here uh, seven years ago was a big shock moving from Walla Walla, from a farm town where my two-bedroom home cost me $450 a month, including utilities, Like, that was all in, and I'm like, an apartment here is how much? Uh, You know, so it was a big culture shock even moving uh, to this area as well. But in ancient times, the city of Smyrna, it contended with Ephesus and Pergamum for the honor of being called the greatest city in all of Asia. Smyrna also claimed to be the birthplace of the famous poet Homer, and they had built a shrine to his honor. 
It had become the center for the cult of Roman emperor worship, a fanatical religion under Nero, which brought on severe persecution for the early church. And it was a proud and beautiful city. But it was taken over and destroyed around 600 B.C. and it was rebuilt in, in 290 A.D. as a model city. And it boasted a library, a stadium, and the largest public theater in all of Asia. It was a town of about 200,000 people and had a special relationship with Rome. And their strong allegiance with Rome, plus a huge Jewish population, made this city very unfriendly to followers of Jesus. And persecution of Christians was the order of the day, and it would remain that way for some time. But persecution has never stopped the progress of God's kingdom. And the church was growing. And this morning we're going to take a look at this letter to this church, and we're going to see that it really applies to us currently as well. We're going to see that there's truth that's only found in Jesus. We're going to talk about a question that we must wrestle with as well. And then the encouragement Jesus has for our souls. And at the end, we're all going to have a chance to respond to the good news of Jesus and discover what real riches is. So if you're ready, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. I'll be reading in the New Living Translation, and it'll be on the screen as well. But it says this, verse 8. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who is dead but is now alive. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. And whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. We're going to take a look at this passage and break it down throughout the message. And we read it in the NLT to the beginning, and then we'll read it in the NIV later just to give you a little bit of the context and understand the fullness of it. But here's the truth we see found in Jesus. Jesus stands as the superior answer to cultural claims. Jesus stands as the superior answer to cultural claims. Whether you like it or not, You are influenced and heavily influenced by the culture you live in. Your thoughts, your behavior, and dreams are partly shaped simply by when you were born, where you were born, and where you currently live. Getting to work with students, uh, I get to take kids to camp every year. And junior high camp is an amazing thing. It has wonders beyond anything you have ever seen. If you've ever been with 400 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, I invite you next summer. Join me. I could use the help. But it's always an interesting uh, study on culture, on what's culturally trending. You know, two years ago, it was this thing called the dab, where they, like, throw one hand up and put another hand, and I'm like, and I'm like, Why? Like, you look like you're smelling your armpit. Like, that's literally what you look like. And this year, it was this dance called the floss. And every game, every, any time a middle schooler had a spare moment where they weren't being directed, they just did this dance called the floss where they just, like, throw their hands. Like, I don't even know how to do it, uh, you know? But that, that's, I'm like, what's going on? Jesus, we need your help. But really, we're all influenced by culture. I think of my grandma who was 90 who was born in Kansas in a sod house. She wasn't born in a hospital. She was not just born at home, but she was born in a sod house. And we have to explain to like my, my niece who's sick, she's like, what's a sod house? My grandma's like, well, it had sticks and like dirt and grass on the outside. She's like, that's awesome. My grandma's like, no, it wasn't, um, you know, but it was coming out of the Depression, and, and they actually drove and moved to uh, Randall, Washington, 
so that her dad could become a logger because the logging industry was booming. And so her life was influenced and shaped by that culture, but so was ours. So was the church in Smyrna. And your thoughts and behaviors or dreams are shaped by when you were born, where you were born, and where you currently live. You know, when I was growing up, there was dreams of being like a professional athlete. That's like what me and all my friends. Working with students now, you ask a lot of like younger kids, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to have a YouTube channel. I didn't even know what a YouTube channel was when I was 12. You know, it didn't exist. And so our, our lives are currently being shaped by that. There's three key phrases here that Scripture is purposely honing in on that I want to bring out of the NIV. And it says this in Revelation 2, 8 through 11, in verse 8, it says this. To the angel in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is first and last, who died and came to life. This phrase, these are the words. See, Smyrna was famous for its words. It was the birthplace of, of the Greek poet Homer. And the Greeks of Smyrna said, said this. They would always say, we have the words. Homer's from our town. We have the words. But Jesus comes in and says, no, I am the word. And he sets himself up as the superior claim to their cultural customs, to their cultural pride. He says, no, I am the word. And then it says this, to him who is first and last. Smyrna was a prideful city. They had great pride in their, in their town and, and, and where they were from. And on every coin minted in, in every government building, there was this phrase that would say, Smyrna, first in Asia. And it was their pride. Like when you gave a coin, he said, this is a Smyrna coin, first in Asia. And there was great pride. But Jesus stands and says, not only are you not the first, but I'm the first and the last. And all things are done through Jesus. And then it says this, who, who died and came to life again. See, Smyrna had died as a city. They had been conquered in 600 B.C., and they'd come back to life again. But Jesus makes this point. I am the one who has faced death. But death could not defeat me, and I've come back to life, and not just life currently, but life forevermore. And so he stands and says, whatever your top cultural claims are, Smyrna, they're actually fulfilled in me. To the church, don't look to the culture to fulfill your expectations. Look to me. Don't look to the culture for your hope. Look to me. And the, and, and the scripture is always pointing us to realize the realities in our cultures and turn our eyes and hearts towards Jesus. Because it is so easy to get wrapped up in the culture you live in. So easy for your heart to get wrapped up in the dreams that culture says they have for you. And it's a constant battle to tend and fix our eyes towards Jesus. Jesus is making this point in his memo to Smyrna that he is the writer, not Homer. He is the first in Asia and everywhere else, and he's the one who died and came to life again. And the gospel still stands as superior to the claims found in our culture still stands. You see, we talk about we live in America, and I'm grateful for our freedom. But true freedom's not found in being an American. True freedom's found in being a follower of Jesus. Because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. We live in a culture that I'm thankful for my rights. I'm thankful for the Constitution. I'm thankful for for legislators that try to protect those rights, or maybe you don't feel like they are. But Jesus says this. He says, I laid down my rights as son of God so that you might become sons and daughters of God, so that you might have rights and rights forevermore. And so we still live in, in, in a time when Jesus will challenge our cultural norms, and he'll stand and say, I am still the fulfillment of everything your culture says is true and right. And so the decision we all must face is this. Is the truth found in the world or is it found in the word? Is the truth for your life found in the world, found in culture, or is it found in the word, in scripture, and in God? You see, the gospel will challenge every part of your being, every part of your thinking, and every part of your living. That's why it's called a new way of life. 
It's a new way of living, a new way of loving, and a new way of being. And the church in Smyrna was struggling with this. You see, the cost of following Jesus was great. And it was costing them what they felt everyone else in their culture was receiving. And they had to wrestle. Would they continue following Jesus in the face of immense hardship, or would they give in? And would they become a part of the culture? Or would they stand as a witness to testify that the true fulfillment of all the cultural promises is actually found in Jesus, and not in their town, not in their heritage, not in their culture, but in Christ? And it's still the same question that we must wrestle with. And and here's the question we must wrestle with. It's this, is it worth it? Have you ever wondered that? Like, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Maybe you're playing a sport. Maybe you're a young person and you got practice and you're like, I don't know if it's worth it today. I don't know if it's, I don't want to go to practice. Maybe you have a job. You're like, I don't know if it's worth going today. Maybe you're in a marriage. Like, I don't know if it's worth it today. Maybe you're in a friendship, and you're like, I don't know if it's worth it today. It's a question we struggle with is whether we're going to put forth the effort, the energy, and what it takes. Maybe you're a parent of a teenager, and you're like, can I put them up for adoption today? (laughs) Is there some family in our community that will love them? Because I'm running out of patience. He says this in Scripture in verse 9. Church of Smyrna was wrestling with, is it worth it? And they were facing tough things. It says, Scripture says this, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Afflictions, poverty, slander. Those are three things I really try to avoid on a daily basis. Afflictions. This Greek word means under intense duress, constant pressure, with seemingly no way to get out. Poverty. See, being a Christian at this time didn't just socially exclude you. Being a Christian at this time in business-wise excluded you. People wouldn't associate with followers of Jesus. They wouldn't hire them. They wouldn't trade with them. And even if they were producing things, they wouldn't buy them. Simply because they weren't either worshipers uh, of, of the emperor of Rome. And so they were under immense poverty. Most of them were struggling just to live. And they're struggling just to live and they're seeing everyone else around them seemingly thrive financially. And they were slandered. They were talked poorly about. They were made fun of. They were called cannibals, which at that time or any time is probably not an enjoyable term. They're called cannibals because of the way they saw communion, that they were partaking in remembrance of the blood and body of Jesus. They were just talked terribly about. They were struggling. They were poor. They were, they were being talked bad about. They were under great duress. They were facing jail. Do you see that scripture says, some of you will be thrown into prison. That's not like an idea. That's kind of like a promise. And you'll be there for 10 days. And and, and that 10 days, it could mean a literal 10 days. Or or sometimes in scripture, it means 10, 10 emperors of Rome. That could be a long time. And they're looking at it like, ah, man, poverty, poor. And some of you will even die. I mean, that's great duress. I'd be stressed out. I'd be sweating a little bit. I don't know if I'd be walking around wearing a a Hawaiian shirt with pineapples all over it. Uh, I don't know if that would be my mentality. I would be struggling. And this church is struggling greatly. But yet the gospel declares them rich. Now that's kind of a, a dichotomy. In one sense, they're under heavy pressure, burdened beyond all they can bear. They're social outcasts. And they are the poorest of the poor in their city, yet the gospel declares them rich. Is it possible to be rich in this world and yet be utterly poor? 
Yes. Is it possible to be poor yet utterly rich? Yeah. Because when we talk about rich in culture, we're talking about wealth. When you talk about rich and for your soul, you're talking about the fullness of your soul. And there's only one answer for the fullness of your soul, and that's Jesus. Because he's the only one that can satisfy your soul's desires, your soul's cravings. There's no bank account. There's no assets. There's no investment. There's no home anywhere that can bring fulfillment to your soul. It can bring distraction. It can can bring rest periodically, but it won't bring fulfillment to your soul. And so Jesus is standing and saying, I truly want you to be rich. And the things that are most enriching to your soul have nothing to do with wealth. You see, the gospel makes you rich. Salvation, giving your life to Jesus, gives you something that you could never buy and never earn. It's a free gift. It sets you up for a relationship with Jesus now, but for eternity and for forever. God living inside of you makes you rich. The Holy Spirit, God in you, encouraging you, speaking to you, telling you to keep doing the right thing, to keep going forward, to keep loving, to stand firm in the midst of tough times. The gospel and God inside you makes you rich. The church, the people of God surrounding you, coming alongside you, praying for you, Believing when you don't have the ability to believe. Having hope for you when you've lost all hope. Sending texts, sending notes, sending encouragements, buying you a meal, coming alongside you. There's, that makes you rich. Be a part of the church. Not just attending church, but be a part of the community of God saying we're in this together. No matter what's ahead, we're going together. One of the things I love being a part of is life with students. Last Sunday, we had 25 high schoolers in our living room. Remember, last Sunday was hot. We don't have air conditioning. We threw a we love you surprise going away party for two girls that were precious to us that are moving with their family to Colorado. One of them was just baptized two weeks ago, and and we walk in, and uh, I knew they were all there, but it was a surprise. I look in my living room, and there's no one there but there's a pile of 25 pairs of shoes right at the door. And these girls are looking at these shoes like, Pastor Tyler, you not put away your shoes? Uh, I'm like, no, no. And all of a sudden, it was surprise and out of closets and behind drapes and popping up from counters. Like, the living room just filled with this shout of surprise. And I was like, whoa, you guys hid really well. I could not see any of you. And we had such a great time. They were there for about two and a half hours, and, and when they left, uh, our home smelled like pizza, dirty feet, and a little bit of body odor from the heat. And I just took that in and said, I am rich. I am so rich. Why? Not because of the pizza. Not because of the smell of dirty feet and even musty, sweaty body odor, but because of the life that I get to do with others and the encouragement that people bring into my life and the encouragement that God gives me the opportunity to bring into others. The people of God, the church, makes you rich. The gifts of God in your life make you rich. On February 15th, 2015, I became rich. I hit the lottery. When she turned that corner and saw it was me standing at the end of the aisle, and she kept coming, that was a miracle of God. (laughs) That was a miracle of God. But marriage, God's gift into my life, then to use me as a gift to show her the love of Jesus, to lay down my life lay down my pride, which I'm not always good at. That's what God's calling me to be. On September 27th last year, 2017, I became rich. Now, this wasn't our ideal first family photo. (laughs) It's not the outfit my wife picked out. It's not the outfit I picked out. But we had an emergency C-section, and things were a little hairy there for a little bit. And the moment we got to first be together, 
man, we felt rich. We felt rich. The gift of family. We got the chance two weeks ago to be with family and cousins together. So fun to watch them love my daughter and, and time together and the laughter. And we were at Northwest Trek and seeing the animals. Like There's these moments you're like, man, I am so rich. And then when I look in this little girl's face, and even she's amen in me over there right now, this is Finley Grace, my little girl. I wasn't prepared for how personal it had become. I always wanted to be a dad. Always. And then when I found out I was being a dad to a girl, the dream started taking shape differently. And then when I met her, I said, I'm not just a dad. And I'm not just a dad to a little girl. I am Finley Grace's dad. And I am the best shot of her knowing the love of Jesus on her until the day she gets married, which is a very, 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 very long time from now. <laughs> but not just the gifts of God into your life, the mission of God, in your life makes you rich. The ability to take on God's business, seek and save the lost. Got to have lunch with my buddy Norm here on Thursday, and man, if you don't know Norm, get to know Norm. But his life has been transformed. It's been transformed because the mission of the church matters, connecting all generations to Christ. And not only has Norm's life been changed, but now he's reaching out to others. And to hear his story, like I was like, God, you are so amazing. Had to be a part of this. To see Bob get baptized a couple weeks ago, right back there, and, and him. This has been a long journey. If you were here, I had a hard time getting him back up. The water was low, and for those of you in there, it looked like I was drowning him. I wasn't. I've never drowned anyone <laughs> baptizing. I'm trying to keep a clean record that way. Um, but afterwards, he says, This was 60 plus years in the making. The gospel makes us rich. The hope of Jesus being shared amongst our culture, even in a culture where it's not popular. The church in Smyrna was in the midst of a culture that was not only popular, it was dangerous for them. But yet the church thrived. And Jesus declared them rich. They faced prison, persecution, death. Makes my challenges seem rather small. But what lies ahead of you is not greater than Jesus can overcome. What lies ahead cannot undo the work that Jesus has already done. And what lies ahead cannot alter the future that Jesus has prepared for you. When we partner with Jesus, we are victorious. We are overcomers. And so then, Scripture gives us the encouragement that Jesus has for our souls. Verse 10, it says this, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. There's two things for encouragement. Don't be afraid and remain faithful. If you told me that death, prison, and persecution were coming my way, I would be afraid. Hey, don't be scared, but you might be arrested, you might be thrown in jail, and you might die. Oh, yeah, what's there to be afraid of? No problem, just a Monday in the office. Um, you know, that's like, but no, but it's like, don't be afraid. And then remain faithful. Not just faithfulness, but faithfulness to the end. That means faithfulness in all things, faithfulness in spite of all things, and faithfulness through all things. Because if you do that, you will receive the crown of life. The crown of life. And verse 11 is key. It says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. And he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. When you give your life to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes inside of you and he speaks to you mostly through Scripture. If you're not in your word, you're going to have a hard time going forward. 
There's times when scripture, it seems like, even though it was written a couple thousand years ago, it seems like it was written that morning from the hand of God to you. Because the Spirit of God quickens it, it alivens it, and it applies it to the situations you're currently going through and currently facing. You need the people of God praying with you, praying for you. The summer camp was special. There was a, a, a man named Joel who two years ago stood with me at an altar, and he put his arm around me. And he just put his arm around me, and he said, I just want you to know God says you're going to be a great dad. And I wept because we had just suffered our third miscarriage. And I didn't know if I'd ever be a dad. And this summer, he put his arm around me. He goes, how you doing, dad? And I wept again. I said, thank you. Thank you for believing when it was impossible for me to believe. Thank you for standing with me. Thank you for standing beside me. Thank you for praying. We need that in our life. You need the church. And not the building, not the programs, not the opportunities to serve so you feel good. You need the church, the people of God. And the church needs you. Each person in here, the church needs you because we have been strategically placed in the places, in the homes, in the jobs, in the relationships to carry out the work of God. And not so we can lay our head and I said, man, I did a good job for Jesus today. I'm saying, man, the gospel still matters. It still makes a difference. It still transforms and it still breathes new life. We are rich because of Jesus. We are rich because we are sons and daughters. And we are rich because we're overcomers in Christ. Romans eleven thirty three 36, we're going to close with this, says this. How, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts and who can give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. And all glory to him forever. Amen. The good news of Jesus and the riches of knowing God are for you today. We can have the worship team come forward. We're going to close. Whether you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you have at one point, but you haven't been living for him. I want to encourage you today that God wants to make you rich. But not rich in your bank account and not prospering your business, but rich in your soul. To know him. For him to be a part of your life. For you to have a new way of thinking, a new way of living, and a new way of loving. And that invitation is tugging on your heart today. Maybe you have what you need or maybe you don't, but inside you feel empty. You feel like there's something missing. It's Jesus. It's what you were designed for. It's what you were created for, to be in relationship with your heavenly Father, and it's offered for you today. Maybe you're here today and just living in this culture, you've had a wrong perspective and you realize it and you've been struggling maybe financially or relationally and you're just frustrated with life and God's reminding you, you are rich. Focus on the right things. Renew a meaningful relationship with me. Make me the highest priority again. You are rich. Maybe you're walking through some tough things and you need someone to stand alongside you. You need someone to put an arm around you and pray for you. You need someone to have faith where you're having doubts. We have prayer partners, but you don't always have to go to a prayer partner. Maybe you have a friend. Go to a friend. Someone that will continue to walk with you. Someone that will text you. Someone that will call you. Lay down your pride. Say, hey, I'm struggling. You might find out they're struggling too. And the partnership together is what makes the gospel beautiful. But God wants you to be rich. But real riches, riches that will last into eternity, the crown of life, that's his goal, is that you would enjoy eternity with him forever. And that's the mission of this church. And I invite you into that mission. If you know the riches of Jesus and they fill your heart, do amazing things with that. 
Live purposefully. Invest in others. Invite them into the story that God's creating for you and for others. And we want to be a church that reaches out. A little girl's back there waving to me. You know what I love about her? When I come home, do you know where her eyes are? On me. Dad. She loves her mom, but she really loves her dad right now. <laughs> really loves her dad. When I come home, she points and lifts her arm and goes, Daddy, 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 Daddy. Daddy, 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 Daddy. And God's just reminded me, says, Tyler, I want your eyes on me. You're my son. I want your affections. I want your best. For you, I encourage you that today in this moment, that you allow God's working in your heart to bring you real riches. And wherever you're struggling, whether it's in your finances, whether it's physically, whether it's relationally, in a marriage, don't forfeit the truths of the gospel for the lies of our culture. Don't. It will bankrupt you in your soul. God's way and his truths are the only way to true fulfillment for your soul. He created your soul and he designed it to be filled by him. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, in this moment, I pray that you would do the work that only you can do. God, you're the only one that can take your truth and penetrate the hearts and make it come alive. God, and I pray right now, God, that your truth, God, would be doing the work in people's hearts and souls. And God, that when we respond, that it would be an authentic response to the hope we found in you. God, and I pray today that we would leave saying, Thank you, Jesus. I am so rich. I'm so rich because of the gospel, the good news given to me. I am so rich because of the people of God, the church that you've given me. I'm so rich because of the gifts of God in my life. God, and I'm so rich because of the hope that I have in you for eternity. And so right now in this moment, maybe you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you say, man, in this moment, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want him to come into my life and fill my soul with the true riches that are found in him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray with you. I want to join. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Let's pray together. Would you pray with me just as a church believing? Say, dear Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for always pursuing me. And today, I say that my riches are found in you. I invite you in. I give you my life and help me to live my life for you. May my life make a difference for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we celebrate with those that raised their hand today? Thank you.